Hi, I'm Katie Miranda and welcome to the Palestine Solidarity Telesummit. Today I'm here with author and journalist Allison Weir of the website If Americans Knew. Can you start by telling us a little bit more about yourself and about If Americans Knew? Like what are the goals of the website? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, just my background is, as maybe people already know, but um, I'm somebody who knew very little about this issue 14 or 15 years ago. Like most Americans, I really had never focused on it. I don't happen to be Jewish or Muslim or Arab, and I really was really basically uninformed about it, but sympathetic to Israel. Then when the second intifada began in fall of 2000, and I began to pay attention, I noticed the news coverage seemed very one-sided. When I looked into it more, uh, using the internet and to try to discover what was actually going on, I discovered really excellent reports from the Palestinian media, from Israeli media, from international uh, individuals who were there and started to learn what was going on and to see how much was not being covered in the U.S. media. So after a few months, I was so so disturbed and astonished at what I found, I decided to go over there as a freelance reporter in um, early 2001 and just travel around to see for myself what was going on. I went around Gaza and the West Bank, and when I, be when I came back, I started the organization If Americans Knew, just to get the information to the general public in a non-political, non-ideological way, really very much uh, my intention has been to a journalistic way where basically I feel people have the right to know the facts as fully as possible and that's what we try to give them. So we do that through the website but we also have a lot of other activities. We um, do a number of reports. I write articles. I speak around the country. There's a whole team at If Americans Knew Now It's Not Just Me uh, to use as many ways as we can to get information out to Americans about what's going on there, especially since we, we give so much money to Israel. Um, the U.S. government gives Israel over $8 million per day. It's really closer to $10 million per day. Wow. And, and our government uh, vetoes many resolutions on behalf of Israel. So Americans like myself who think, well, it's, you know, that's such a sad issue, it's far away, it has nothing to do with me, are incorrect. We have a great deal to do with it, and it has a great deal to do with us. So that's one of the things we try to emphasize at If Americans Knew. We are very much responsible um, for Israeli activities, which unfortunately are, are many of them are, violate human rights and international law. So therefore, we are being connected, we are funding uh, criminal activities, violent activities, oppressive activities, discriminatory activities, and as we know from blowback, if, if you are causing damage or harm to others, at some point you will be on the receiving end of damage or, or harm. So it's, that's one of the reasons it's so important that Americans know we're connected to it and know what's actually going on there uh, because I feel that, that all of us when we know the fact, we'll not be happy with American policy. When, when voters decide on a policy, we, we can make a change in our governmental actions. But that won't happen, I feel, until and unless Americans really have the full information on that. In today's world, where it's really, you know, very much just one superpower right now, there are you know, other very important factors, but that makes the U.S. extraordinarily important. And American citizens, potentially extremely important. We're sort of the sleeping giant in this issue. So even though there are people in Europe and Palestine, throughout the Middle East and Israel, that are trying to bring change, we're the ones that have, I feel, the greatest potential to succeed in doing that. And that gives us the obligation to know about the issue and I feel to do something about it. Could you tell us some of the success stories that If Americans Knew have, has had in changing the uh, media discourse on the subject of Israel and Palestine? I feel that the work that we've been doing now, and it's been over, it's been about 14 years, uh, has had a real impact on media coverage, but largely indirectly. 
our, our media studies ha- are now being used widely by many people and many individuals, where we found, for example, that the network coverage of deaths among both populations of children's deaths, we found they were covering them up, covering Israeli children's deaths at rates up to 13 and 14 times greater than they were reporting on Palestinian children's deaths. We've also exposed that the Associated Press has a very questionable um, system of reporting on the issue in which the control bureau through which every, almost all of its news stories um, are filtered is located in Israel and it's staffed, oh, wow. largely, it's staffed largely by Israeli editors. So uh, we have a conflict, you know, Israelis versus Palestinians that's being largely filtered through Israeli journalists. This is not a healthy situation. Some Israeli journalists, as I, I'm sure you know, there's Amira Haas and Gideon Levy, are excellent reporters on this issue. But in general, when you have a conflict between two populations, one population should not be in charge of the coverage. And that's, that's to a degree what's going on. So we've discovered that, we've been exposing it, I've written about it quite a bit, I speak about it around the country um, I think our our methodology of discussing the media as a, a central part of, of what's wrong in this issue has been taken up by many others. There's a wonderful journalist that does a, a critique of the New York Times. I think it's it's called Times Warp. Oh, yeah. It's valuable. Um, there's a, a website by Philip Weiss that talks about the media quite a bit. The, many all, uh, These things came up after we had begun this. We weren't the first people to do it, but I think we we were an important in paving the way and really emphasizing the media coverage, how significant that is to this entire issue. And I think that, that the work we've done and then the work that others have done along those lines have, in, in the time I've been working on this, I now see the New York Times will use the word Palestine and Palestinian before it was mostly Arab, mm-hmm. the Arab-Israeli conflict, that type of thing. So I think we've had an, an, an impact on the, the terminology that's used, the awareness. I think now people in the mainstream media uh, have only acknowledged just a little bit. The New York Times has, a few others have. But I think they now know that someone is looking over their shoulder and holding them to the ethics that journalists are supposed to follow. I've, in a number of cases, written about violations of journalistic ethics, cited their own ethics uh, principles and how they violated them. Uh, I did that recently with David Brooks, who's a, a pundit, as he's called, for a number of organizations, including NPR and CNN, the New York Times uses him, um, quite a few others do, and turned out that he, while he was commenting on Gaza, he had a son that was serving in the Israeli military. Mm-hmm. This is completely inappropriate, that's a conflict of interest, at minimum, it should have been divulged to his readers and listeners. In fact, he should have been taken off that beat immediately. Once it came out, uh, there should have been an apology, a major uh, announcement about it. We pushed it quite a bit, and because I think of the amount that Adif Americans knew pushed it, we did get, you know, some of the ombudsmen have now acknowledged that there was, that was maybe a little bit wrong and it should be revealed to readers. So, You know, these are sort of general impacts that we've had through the years. Great. And so one of the other things your website offers is free printed material about Israel and Palestine. Can you tell us about that? What what do you send out to people? How have people used it? And how can students um, get copies of this material? Yes, that's one of our major activities. I forgot to even mention it. We mail thousands and thousands of pieces around the country to different individuals and to groups, often student groups, sometimes peace and justice groups, sometimes people at churches, really very, very diverse recipients. To get the, again, you know, our effort is to get these facts out to the general public as widely as we can, to every, every political sector of the public. We really don't discriminate. If somebody asks for our information, we send it to them. Anybody can download it and print it out themselves. It's also 
HTML, so it's very easy to read and just look at and maybe, you know, copy facts if you want to out of it to use in a letter to the editor, for example. And in many cases, there are uh, articles or longer reports that others have done that we find are excellent, factual, very clear. But one, of, one of the best ones is called The Origin of the Palestine-Israel Conflict. It's a, a fairly long pamphlet, uh, but fairly short in how much it covers. It's really an excellent introduction to whole, the whole conflict. And it was put together, I, I think, about 15 or 20 years ago by a Jewish group that no, no longer exists. I think the people all work at different organizations now. But we felt that was a very clear explanation. It had citations for its information, which I especially value. I, I think we're known for giving where our information comes from. People should be skeptical. They should want to know, well, where is that? You know, how do I know that fact is true? So that's what we sort of specialize in, and that's what this booklet does. At the end of the book, that there's a conclusion where that group was in favor of a two-state solution. We actually are not convinced that's the fair or just or long-term solution. We tend to more favor a one-state solution, although we feel it's not our job to give the solution. It's our job to give the facts to people. So, you know, that's not exactly what we necessarily would have written, but it's an excellent resource, and it's just one example of something written by others that was factual and informative that we now distribute. Okay, great. So people can just go on to the website ifamericansnew.org and they can find out where to get this free material. And I'm going to put a link to that below this video. So great. just check below if, if you want to get some of that. So you have written a book called Against Our Better Judgment, The Hidden History of How the U.S. Was Used to Create Israel. Can you talk about that book a little bit and why it needed to be written? Sure, I'd be glad to. What happened is once I, after I started to look into this issue and after my trip, I was very curious about the whole history of this, both the, the history in the region and then also in especially the U.S. connection since I'm an American. And uh, the regional, so I started reading books on it and interviewing ex experts. At one point I was working on the documentary, so I've, I interviewed a lot of people also. But I also just read many, many books. I would, you know, look for, again, looking look for books that I felt were reliable, that had footnotes, so I'd know where they'd gotten the information. And then I'd read that book and read those footnotes and then order the books from those footnotes. And then read those books and read those footnotes and order those books. And, you know, now I have I'm sitting in a room literally surrounded by bookshelves full of <laughs> books. And I was, um, the regional history is well covered in, in many books and is fairly clear. The U.S. connection is not written about as frequently, and I think many fewer people understand that. But I began to look into that a great deal. So I, I began to learn so much about the history of the U.S.-Israel relationship, how that was created, how our so-called, well, it actually is a uniquely special relationship, how that was actually created, intentionally created, um, that after a while I realized, it, I st started to notice that I would hear people that were informed, well informed on the region, making statements about the U.S. connection that were inaccurate, um, that thought it was being driven by the military-industrial complex, for example, which usually does drive U.S. policies. But I, I realized, wait, they don't really know the history that this is not what went on. So after a while, I, I eventually decided, okay, I really need to write an article about all this information I have from these books because so many people aren't aware of it. And most of it's not online. And if, in today's world, if it's not online, it doesn't exist. So I decided I would write an article, an in-depth article about the history of, you know, about the U.S., the, the working title was The History of the U.S.-Israel Relationship. When I started writing it, fairly soon I realized that this was, I just couldn't do it in one article. There was too much that was important to know and that it would be a book. It came out last March and happily already it sold about 10,000 copies. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. It's a, that's really a huge number for a book that's, we haven't even yet marketed it 
to bookstores or to libraries, but it's in many cases been word of mouth. When I go to, I now and then know, I, I go to the Amazon page where it's sold, and it already has over 180 customer reviews, and people, you know, most people seem to be giving it five stars and call it eye-opening and a must-read and that type of thing. It's it's very exciting. Yeah. Because it's, it is, people that, I, I've talked to people who knew about this issue long before I, I knew about it. And really have a, an in-depth knowledge of the region, um, both Palestinian American scholars and um, Israeli scholars and um, ambassadors that were in the region, and all of them have told me that were very surprised to learn things in in my book that they had not known before. So uh, the book is aimed both at the general reader, uh, I, I the type of person I was. So I try to make it very accessible to the general reader what was going on, but it's also of interest to pe experts because I think they're finding things that they also had not known about. And I, I intentionally kept the book fairly short, in fact, very short, uh, again, because most people, are we're busy today and we don't want to read long books, so I wanted a book that would be short and concise where you could read it and get a clear understanding of what had been going on instead of getting bogged down in so many details that you'd have all these trees and never understand the forest. So I used a, a strange format where I, the narrative, uh, first I have the narrative, but, you know, with footnotes within it, and then the end notes. And the end notes are actually at least as long as the main text. A lot of information is in the footnotes because I, I would have additional details that I thought were important for people to know, but they didn't need to read it when they were just trying to, under, you know, read the whole uh, beginning history. So people, I, I think, are learning. They read the, they read the book, and then they read the endnotes, which is a, a whole additional source of information. So in the book, you were talking about that during the late 1800s, most American Jews opposed Zionism. Why is that, and what changed? Yes, they did. In fact, that continued for many decades. Um, the Jewish Americans were not in favor of Zionism. Uh, most were non-Zionist. Some were even actively anti-Zionist for, for many years. Well, I think the reason, was, and this was actually the case worldwide, uh, most Jews throughout the world, Zionism was based, the, the political Zionism, which was what founded Israel, began in the late 1800s. And um, the idea was that there needed to be a Jewish state somewhere in the, in the world, and they quickly settled on Palestine, and that all Jews were, were supposed to go there. It was supposed to be this massive ingathering of Jews from around the world. But what the Zionists were disturbed to notice was that most Jews did not want to go there. They had no interest in going there. Uh, English Jews said, we're English. You know, we don't want to go to the Middle East. Amer Jewish Americans were saying the same thing. You know, we're, we're happy here. Many people were writing about that they were extremely happy there, that this was their home and that they were Americans and did not su su uh, support or endorse a political ideology that told them they had to move somewhere else that they felt they had no connection to. So Zionists were very calculated in what they did. They were quite fanatic and they were very smart and eventually they were quite well funded. So they went after every sector of American society with propaganda, with books, with booklets, with petitions, with talking points that would reach up every sector, both business and labor. Christian Americans had, you know, were very much targeted. Jewish Americans were very much targeted. Um, academics were targeted. Congressional representatives were targeted. Um, all were, were uh, provided with, quote, information, very, of course, slanted, um, filtered, semi, you know, pseudo-information, working to convince them that Jews needed and must have a Jewish state in Palestine, and hiding the fact that Palestine was already inhabited by a population that, when Zionism began, was 95% non-Jewish. And it was 80% uh, Muslim, about 15% Christian, a little under 5% Jewish, and that all, of the, all three of those religions 
considered that a holy land for their religion and were living there without conflict. So the people within the region also were opposed to Zionism. Uh, it, this took a major effort by Zionists to change that paradigm. And Hitler played a role in it. You know, once, once Hitler came to power and the Nazis came to power, and there was, you know, increasing oppression, you know, began as oppression, became grew far worse in Europe, Zionists saw this as an opportunity to push Zionism and to make it seem that, well, see, there has to be a safe haven for Jews, and it, quote, has to be in Palestine. So they would interfere with refugee efforts uh, where Jewish refugees from Europe could go elsewhere. They sabot worked to sabotage those efforts. That was the period that really changed the Jewish connection to Zionism. And, and sadly, the Zionist efforts at manipulation finally succeeded so that eventually many Jewish Americans came to feel that they were supporting Zionism. So the media coverage is still very biased against Palestinians, but we do have to acknowledge the huge shifts that have been happening over the years. And in my opinion, it's largely due to citizen journalists like yourself who are documenting what's going on in Palestine, both foreigners and Palestinians themselves. Um, they're publishing it online, uploading it to YouTube. In my opinion, I think YouTube has been a major, major reason why things are shifting. Um, what, in your opinion, has caused this change? I completely agree with you. I think, um, I, I like that term, citizen journalism. I think that that is having a major impact, both, you know, within the region, Palestinians themselves, who were already, had have, have written excellent articles and pieces about this and analyses for many years, but they just weren't getting to the American public. Once we had the internet, more then, then they started to have access to Americans and Americans began to have access to them. Then, as you say, the fact that uh, there was an effort to get video cameras in the hands of more Palestinian, just general Palestinians throughout the West Bank and Gaza to be able to videotape what was being done to them was a very powerful change. And those YouTube videos that have been uploaded since, you know, in these past 10 or 15 years are extremely powerful. Many Israelis, of course, are, have joined this nonviolent movement in the occupied territories. And their videos have, you know, of course, you know, we have these very diverse videos now that are on YouTube that are from Palestinians, from Israelis, from internationals, from um, some Christian groups, Christian peacemaker teams, for example, have done this type of thing, that's, that's made a huge difference because now the word and, and the images and the information is getting straight to the public. I wrote one article uh, in which I, just, I showed how these images, the mainstream images, were being blocked from reaching Americans. Really? That cameramen and videographers employed by places like Associated Press were supplying images and videos to the Associated Press being used that were being erased. Uh, by there was one case where being erased a young boy by who? Yes. Um, in that, this case, the cameraman was told to erase it, that they weren't interested in the video. I found a case where I, I actually contacted CNN about a small boy who had been killed. He'd been shot in the throat, I believe in Nablus. I, I contacted um, CNN headquarters to tell them about it because I was actually staying in a hotel that night where I could see CNN International and there was no mention of that at all. There was there was mention that there was Israeli news so you know, it seemed strange that they hadn't mentioned that. So I found a way, it was sort of difficult, but I actually called up CNN headquarters and said I have a news tip. You know, a, a, a boy was killed by Israeli forces today, shot in the, in the throat. And the woman said, I know I've seen the footage. And I, I was shocked. I said, well, I'm not seeing, you know, I'm watching CNN and I don't see any of it on, on TV. And she said, I, I know. I and mean, clearly she was, I, you know, it's hard to remember her exact words right now, but it was clear she was sympathetic to me. And she said, I know I'm trying to get them to show it. Um, I'm trying. But they never did show it. So clearly they had gotten 
either, you know, she said footage. So those powerful images in that, you know, I learned directly are at times very intentionally not being shown to Americans. But because with YouTube and alternative media, we're, we're getting them after all. Even yeah. if the mainstream media don't show them to us, other people are getting them directly to us. And then also, of course, there are alternative radio shows in the United States and, and uh, you know, some, some alternative TV. There's public access TV. So all of this, I think, is making a, a huge difference and making – it's causing a great deal of pressure on the mainstream media to, to not necessarily – well, they're improving their coverage. I guess mainly I'd say it's not as bad. <laughs> and I think some, you know, occasionally excellent stories do come out on the mainstream media too. That's always been the case. It's just that so little compared to the ones that contain spin or incorrect context or very Israeli centric context. Yeah, so you and If Americans Knew are starting a billboard campaign. Can you tell us more about this? Yes, this is, again, this is very exciting to me because we're just trying to find every way possible to reach, reach Americans. And billboards, of course, are very, reach all Americans. They don't reach a certain demographic or age necessarily, I guess, unless you choose a location. But we try to choose locations with lots of people driving by. Mm -hmm. So um, we've been doing this for a number of years. We have a, several types of billboards we've put up. We've put up some, we... We often emphasize the American connection. And it's not because I'm so cynical. I think Americans are all horrible people that only care about themselves. But I know how busy we are. I know that most people are struggling to make a living, are struggling to raise children, often having to you know, have, hold several jobs at the same time and raise small children. So people are very busy and stressed already. If we give them information that is very relevant to them, they're more likely that they feel they have the time to look into it. So our billboards often talk, say something like, eight million dollars per day to Israel just does not make sense. We have a lot of those billboards around. Uh, at Christmas we had billboards that uh, about the wall in Bethlehem. The title was O Little Town of Bethlehem and showed a wonderful illustration that people believe was done by Banksy. Banksy's anonymous, so we don't know for sure, but it seems to have been done by Bank Banksy that shows Mary and Joseph trying to go to Bethlehem, but there's a big wall in between. So he had those billboards around at Christmas time. Then with what we try to do too, uh, uh, many people now are putting billboards up, which is excellent. What we do that I don't think enough others do is we specifically put have them connect to a website. So when people see the billboard, they can go to a website and and get direct information about that. For example, at one point we had billboards in Detroit about the amount of money that, that goes to the um, to Israel. And then we, I believe the web, we gave ifamericansnew.org was on the billboard. So when people went to our website, right in a prominent place, right on that first page they would hit, was the billboard and in some information about Detroit they could click on and there was a whole page that told both about the details of how much money goes to Israel with the citation so people would know that was accurate. We also told about how much Detroit was suffering, how many of the um, firemen and were being laid off and teachers were being laid off and, and crowded classrooms also was on that web page that specifically connected to the billboard in Detroit. Have you had any feedback about the billboards from people who've said, hey, I, I saw this billboard and I went to your site? We have had some. We've had, um, at one point, we had, um, I've, we've had people call us up saying, wow, I had no idea about this. We get a lot of emails from people saying, we, of two types. It's interesting because probably most often people say, thank you, I had no idea about this information. Um, in other cases, people will email us saying, I always knew th this was sort of wrong, but I felt I was alone and I didn't really know the facts. Thank you for it. And, of course, we get host many hostile emails from 
yeah. your partners who are very angry at this information getting out and they give us you know all the 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 false talking points that they've been been brainwashed with but we do get feedback from it and it, it's we'll be doing more and more of those we have we're talking about some more campaigns so i think it's one of the most important things we can do because again this gets us straight out to the general public so any we constantly are fundraising to get money for these billboards. We try to find what we feel are the best deals, where we get the you know the most viewers for the the least amount of money. We put them around the country. We often go to the less um, populated states where you get much more for your money. Where you're you know there we're getting a very what we're looking for is a large percentage of voters. We're not looking for consumers. So in a place like South Dakota. South Dakota or Montana, billboards might be relatively inexpensive because for merchandisers there aren't enough people to sell a lot too. But what we want is just voters. So yeah. we can sit there and then we can get a high percentage of the voters. And those states, like every state, have two senators. So potentially that can be a very effective strategy. Um, we feel, I feel strongly that people across the political spectrum can be reached on this issue if we just get them the facts. Yeah, I agree. And so because, Allison, because you're helping make such a difference out there, I want I really want to support that. So I've decided to partner with Allison and If Americans New to help fundraise to continue their work and do these billboards. And I'm going to do that by donating $7 from every item purchased of my jewelry or apparel for the month of February. So I've got some great Valentine's Day gifts for you if you're looking for something like that. Um, you can shop for gifts at katymiranda.com and so seven dollars of every item will go to If Americans New to help support that billboard campaign. So I wanted to thank you very much, Allison, for your time and for all the hard work you've done. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me on your program and for your art. I, I was given one of your scarves several oh. years ago, and it's just lovely. You know, oh, it, thank it's you. It's beautiful and moving, and I wear it all the time. So. Oh, great. <laughs> thank you so much, Allison.